planets. Yes, that's right. Uh, I draw the planets too, as you know, but unlike you, I'm not a good artist. Therefore, what I do is to make my rough drawing at the telescope eyepiece, then turn on a dim light and make a better copy of it, and then go back and check my drawing at the telescope once more to make sure I haven't made any mistakes. But of course, a better artist, such as yourself, can make the originals at the telescope, and I know that's what you do. Yes, it's a method I prefer, actually. Um, the, t the drawing that I make at the telescope would, in actual fact, be a near-finished drawing. All it would require is a little bit more work to bring it up, but I try to finish it as near as possible at the eyepiece. You know, Paul, taking this drawing that you made of the telescope and comparing it with the one in your actual notebook, that doesn't seem a lot of difference to me. No, well, there isn't a great deal of difference. Of course, you don't want to, to have to do too much to it once you've finished the drawing at the telescope. The only thing is to enhance the detail a little bit and smooth the overall appearance off by putting this limb darkening in, which is always there and which you don't need to do at the telescope. Well, there's plenty of detail shown. Well, yes, and it's always nice to get confirmation of yes. that detail. This is a photograph by Horace Dahl, as you know, yes. and uh, the detail shown on that bears a great resemblance to the detail on the drawing. It compares very favourably. The only difference being, of course, that the centre of the planet rotates rather more quickly than the edges of the planet, and you can see the difference in the drift on those central markings when you compare it with the markings as seen on the drawing. On the drawing, they're near the edge, whereas on Mr. Dawes' photograph, they're more centrally placed. You know, Paul, the difference between your drawings of Jupiter and mine is that in addition to having the detail accurately placed, your drawings look like Jupiter. And when I do a drawing of Jupiter, it looks like a drawing on a flat piece of paper. Yes, well, the only reason is that I put this limb darkening in, and that makes it more of a globe. But apart from that, the accuracy is, is there in your drawing, which is all that matters. This drawing actually goes back to 1962, and Jupiter looks rather different then. Yes, yes, there's a lot more detail in the centre of the planet, as you can see there, and also the, the detail in this, what we call the South Equatorial Belt, which wasn't in existence when you did that drawing. Because there's one very good reason for making these drawings of Jupiter, the detail's always changing. And of course, that's more than you can say for, well, for Venus, for example. Well, for Venus and Mercury, for that matter, there's not a great deal of detail to be seen. Yeah. All you can see is, is in the nature of, of faint, dusky markings, uh, in, in the manner of this. I note, incidentally, you lay out your observation books in the same way as I do. Yes, th this is a, the, the log that I keep in both cases. I keep a separate book for each planet, and it's an idea I got from you in actual fact <laughs> in the first <laughs> place. But the difference is, as far as Mercury's concerned, I decided to do Mercury in a, in a sort of a colour, tint the drawings so that you could tell at a glance which is Venus and which is Mercury. The markings are so similar that if they were both in black and white, you wouldn't know which is which. So I, I've sort of estimated the colour of Mercury and tried to get that colour as accurately as possible. Venus, of course, is white, so I left it white. I'm interested in seeing all the description of here, what you actually saw on That's Mercury. That's right, yes, and the scene conditions, uh, the sort of things that can affect the observation, which are, are quite important, the time, the date, and the longitude of, of the meridian of the planet at the time. Is that the actual colour you see, Mercury? Yes, yes, it is exactly the colour. Have you checked up the odd drawings of Mercury with the modern type charts? Yes, um, the director of the Venus and Mercury section did check these drawings up with the, the present maps, and he said that all the markings that I had drawn did tie in with those that were actually there. So, Well, you've certainly got keener eyes than I have, because I find Mercury a very difficult object, because well, much more on Mars. Oh, yes, much more on Mars. M Mars is a much more interesting planet oh, altogether, yes. and a much more colourful planet. There's some colour drawings here which I've done of Mars. These were made in 1973, and this, two drawings made in one night to show the, the rotation of the planet, as you can see this feature here. Yes, uh, there yes, he is. that's right. The Martian Greenwich. That's it. Well, that's moved over more centrally on the second drawing. In two hours, there's a considerable drift rate there. And later on in that year, as you'll probably remember, there was a, a great dust storm. I do indeed. The there was planet. a time when you couldn't see any markings that's on Mars right. at all. Well, this dust eventually spread over the whole planet, completely hiding all details. And then, of course, two years later, at the time of that drawing, the dust had completely cleared and everything was back to normal. And again, you've checked these drawings up with the modern type yes, charts. with maps and, and uh, photographs taken up the time, in actual fact. Well, I can make an effort of drawing Mars, of course, but the one that I find really difficult is Saturn. Looking at that magnificent painting of Saturn that you've got here, how long did it take you to make that drawing? Well, it takes considerably longer to do a colour observation. Uh, well, in fact, they're not done at the telescope. It takes about two hours. Um, the observation made at the telescope about 10 to 15 minutes, but the actual colour paintings around about two hours because there's a lot more work involved. Well, again, it looks, uh, it looks there as if Saturn is floating in space. And, Paul, mm -hmm. I think people will be very interested to see just how you go yes. about it. Well, uh, after the preparation of a blank, in fact, um, all you do is build up the, uh, the detail on the planet as you would do at the telescope in black and white. You, you get a, a basic outline and then you build that outline up to make it look like a black and white drawing. And then as far as the colour is concerned, you just put a tint, a wash over the drawing and uh, finally paint the whole thing round with black and there's your result. 
Uh, I'll just, if you like, demonstrate how the drawing is done. Yes, do. The limb darting is rather important to give it um, an overall globe-like effect. And it is actually there, so it is important. But it's very marked and set in. Yes, it is. It, it's a gas planet, of course, and the, the light falls off considerably toward the limbs. And having completed your disc drawing, you then have to start work on the rings yes, themselves. Yes, that's right. One thing I note in the outer ring, the appearance of what's called Enki's division. Well, you know, I've found, Paul, that the appearance of Enki's division is really caused by the fact that the outermost part of ring A and the innermost part of the ring are of slightly different brilliances, and the line of demarcation causes the appearance that we call the division. Yes, I would agree with that now. If you would have asked me that question before I built the 16-inch, I would have disagreed, because with a smaller telescope, it does genuinely tend to look like a division. But now with the larger telescope, with better resolution, it is sort of a dark zone in the rings which does separate the bright inner part of the ring from the dark outer. It's a line of demarcation, I think. That's right. A, a, probably a contrast effect more than anything. Of course, during the next few years, as the rings close up, the inky division is going to get very difficult to see. It will. Next year it will just about be visible, I would think, in moderate telescopes. And following that, I think we can say goodbye to it until about the middle of 1980. So far as the crepe wing is concerned, uh, that has to be made to look transparent. Yes, that'll be done finally with, with a heavy pencil lead inside there, so that it's almost black. Yes. Uh, there is also an interesting demarcation in the rings on ring B. This is the bright ring here, which is very similar to the one in ring A, Enki's division, in actual fact. It's very marked indeed, the ring B. You know, it doesn't give the same appearance of, of being a division. No, it's, it's more or less a zone again in the rings. This will all be resolved, I think, with the Pioneer probes and the Voyager probes. People sometimes think that the rings are set on a uniform all the way over, but they're not. There are very delicate shades there. That's right. There's a lot of um, sort of different shadings over the whole of the rings. In fact, on really clear nights, you can see a considerable amount of detail. But no really fine divisions as far as I can see at any rate. No, I don't think these fine divisions exist at all. Oh, it was Gerard Kuiper who once looked at Saturn with a 200-inch at Palomar, and he said the only division he could see was the Cassini division, with a kind of ripple where the Enki division is meant to be. That's right, and this is how it seems to me, and no doubt you found the same yourself. I have indeed. Well, that's practically it, isn't it, so far that's, as the black and white yep. is concerned. And now that you've got the black and white drawing completed, uh, we come to the all-important question of colour. That's right. Now you've finished the colour wash, comes the all-important point of blacking round the planet. And this is something I find incredibly difficult. Well, having completed that tricky operation, now for the shadows, I take That's it. That's it. Shadows next and the inner parts of the, the ring system there. This really is the most difficult part of the whole thing. Yes, I can appreciate that. It's a shadow of the rings on the globe. Now for the inner no. parts. And the globe on the ring shadow. Because it's this area that you're doing now, which is said by some people to be occupied by another tenuous ring. But I've looked for that ring with pretty big telescopes and I've never seen a trace of it and I'm very skeptical about its existence. Well, this is, this is how I feel. It doesn't seem as if there's anything in there at all to me. Now that the Cassini division has been put in, the drawing is starting to look complete. Yep, there's just a bit more work. The, the whole thing's got to be blacked in completely, yes. of course. And then there's a, a final bit more pencil work to, to sort of make the thing more presentable. And then it'll, it'll be finished. 
Saturn in all its glory, and as well as being a lovely drawing, it's also, of course, an authentic observation. Paul, you've got uh, a very nice telescope and a very nice observatory. What are your future plans? Well, the main thing that I want to do is, is really enlarge upon what I've already done, uh, observe the planets in even more detail, try some measurements with micrometers, get more accurate results, and also try some photography of comets for positional reasons. And, uh, and just that's it, really, more or less enlarge on what I already do. Well, you're certainly doing extremely useful work. Paul, thank you very much, and the very best of luck to you. Thank you. During the last 20 years, uh, the sky at night has been to many professional observatories, and we've talked to many professional astronomers. But now that we've seen Paul Doherty, I think you'll realise what the amateur can do. And remember also that his equipment is home-built. And there's one point I would like to make here, that astronomy is, above all, a science in which cooperation is essential. And that means amateur with amateur, professional with professional, and even more important, I think, professional with amateur. And observatories such as Paul Doherty's have got a really important part to play in modern science, uh, provided they are carefully and systematically used, and this observatory certainly will be. And we've enjoyed coming here. And so, from Stoke-on-Trent, good night. <laughs>